Welcome to Interesting People. As uh, we've referenced before, the show is based upon the fact that uh, there are interesting people everywhere in everybody's family, neighborhood, and community. My name is Tom Lorenzen. I'm the host of Interesting People, and it's being presented under the auspices of the Chabot Las Positas Community College District. We did a, an interview and a discussion here with one of the most important television journalists of our time, Mr. Sander Van Oker. We did a one-hour session, and now we're going to do a second one-hour session with Mr. Van Oker. Welcome back, uh, Mr. Van Oker. Thank you. Nice to see you, Sander. In the first uh, discussion we had, we talked about your life and your career, and we talked about uh, all the events and activities you covered and all the interviews. And again, it's a unique privilege because you conducted some of the most important interviews of our time in TV journalism. And now I have the privilege uh, to be sitting here interviewing you and as a longtime friend as well. And uh, as we uh, go into this uh, portion of this program, we're going to cover from the 1980s forward, and we're going to get some of your views and observations on our current era and looking towards the future as well. And uh, we're going to start with 1980 then. Uh, we have, we're coming to the end of the Carter presidency. You participated in the first debate with President Kennedy and, uh, and Richard Nixon, and we had a second debate in 1976 with uh, President Ford and, uh, and Governor Carter at the time. Then we go to 1980 and we have debates again. And it's President uh, Carter and uh, former Governor Ronald Reagan. The League of Women Voters is pleased to welcome to the Cleveland, Ohio Convention Center Music Hall, President Jimmy Carter, the Democratic Party's candidate for re-election to the presidency, and Governor Ronald Reagan of California, the Republican Party's candidate for the presidency. Tell us uh, what your views are on how the debates have played an important or the role in determining presidential outcomes. We talked about the Kennedy-Nixon debate and, and 76. Going into 1982 with Governor Reagan, he, uh, he came out of, it seems like, almost nowhere to a lot of people. And uh, so we're moving to the 1980 election. What were your thoughts uh, on that election? Well, before? I've always been a great fan of Ronald Reagan going back to the time uh, in the movie where he says, where's the rest of me? Randy! Randy! Where's the rest of me? Randy! Yes, Drake? It was that accident. Yes, dear. But don't talk about it yet. And I watched him. He was a... Uh, very strident Democrat. Then he went to the Republican Party. And uh, I think he was almost thrown up as a necessity by God or nature because the country had lost confidence in itself, especially um, under Carter and the hostages. We continue to face a grave situation in Iran where our embassy has been seized and more than 60 American citizens continue to be held as hostages in an attempt to force unacceptable demands on our country. And I think that Reagan was by chance or by God just put upon us and he gave this country its confidence again. And I must say he knew how to handle the Russians. I was told by somebody in the Reagan administration that the Russians were very impressed when he fired all the air controllers. A strike by air traffic controllers. From the president, a strong warning. They are in violation of the law. And if they do not report for work within 48 hours, they have forfeited their jobs and will be terminated. From the Union, a defiant response. The controllers out there firmly believe in what they are doing. Because that's what they would have done. And he gave the country back its confidence. And he served us well. Well, you were referencing uh, with, uh, we were talking about uh, Ronald Reagan as governor and then uh, going on the presidency. And what you, if you saw the, you know, the possibility that he would go on to the presidency. Uh, I first saw it went to meet the press, which was taped, which is unusual, in Burbank one Sunday. He's running for governor. 
And I said to him, are you a Hiram Johnson, progressive Republican, Earl Warren, or Tommy Kinkle, all on the kind of progressive side of uh, Republicans in this state? Without pause, he said, I was an Earl Warren Republican until he went on the Supreme Court. And uh, then he won, and I was at a governor's conference who he was invited to right afterward in Colorado, standing next to one of his leading advisors of Goldwater, I should say. <coughs> a man who said that he, uh, Cliff White was his name, mm -hmm. and he said, just look at him in this room. Air went out of the room when he walked in. I thought there's something, like Roosevelt had, magical about this guy. And so many of my colleagues keep talking about how smart Carter was. Well, how many people we know in life who are smart and are dumb at the same time? <laughs> This guy was what the country needed, he lived up to it, and he was at peace with himself. I remember when he was getting his tax bill passed, Tip O'Neill came out of a restaurant with too much to drink, and he'd just been badly beaten uh, in the Congress by Reagan's forces. And all he did was say, how are you, pal? And I knew that Ronald Reagan had just taken Tip O'Neill to the cleaners. But they became very good friends. I met a friend of yours uh, who's recently passed, and that was Danny Rostenkowski, who chaired the uh, Ways and Means Committee from Chicago then and uh, visited with uh, the chairman at one point. And he uh, told me also how, right after Reagan became president, he was reached out and invited to come over and have lunch with the president. And, and he prided himself, because as they did serious tax reform on the Ways and Means Committee, that he felt he had gotten more out of Reagan than Reagan got out of him. But he, he stressed how important when Ronald Reagan shook his hand, he kept his word, too. And uh, we're in a period of time now where there's so much partisanship, and yet here Reagan was reached out to Tip O'Neill, Danny Rostenkowski, and probably a lot of other Democrats. What happened in the country? How did, uh, where did the... the media destroyed it? In a project I did for the Freedom Forum First Amendment Center on the post-war Congress and the media, Pat Moynihan, an old friend, said, we used to talk to each other in the cloakroom, on the Senate floor, in conference committee. Now we talk to each other through the weekend talk shows. Hmm, yes. Have you seen lately anybody who gets on television in the political sphere who says, I don't know? Interesting. When President Reagan came in, there were difficult economic times. Uh, I think interest rates were 14 percent, inflation, there was high unemployment. We're in challenging, difficult times now, too. Uh, uh, how, how important is the ability of a president to get the confidence of the people and to get things on track? Is that a pivotal component that Reagan was able to bring to the table? Absolutely. And there's also the element of fear. A lot of people fear what Reagan might do to them. I don't think anybody fears what Obama will do to them. You know, when you mentioned earlier about Reagan, too, uh, uh, Richard Allen, that was Reagan's first national security advisor when he became president, had shared a story with me, and he's written about it, too, about how he was with Reagan in a hotel room in 1978 when they learned that uh, the new pope had been selected and he was from Poland, and that Reagan showed some emotion. And uh, he asked him, he said, Governor, he said, uh, what do you make of this? And Reagan simply said to him, he said, Dick, God just gave us a way out of the Cold War. It was not perceived by a lot of people uh, that Reagan had a lot of insights into the Cold War. As it turns out, maybe we were wrong in that assessment. No, the, the, uh, he went off to meet with uh, Gorbachev, I think. And um, <coughs> I can't remember who told me this, but he had gotten a briefing from the two people who wrote about that ship going down in the North Sea. I can't remember the name of it. And um, he had a sense about what you could do and what you couldn't do. And 
I think he also had a way of making people think he was weaker hmm. than they thought he was. Interesting. You know, it's, um, with Roosevelt, when we talked about uh, FDR earlier and his mastery of radio, and Reagan started actually with a radio career, I think in Des Moines, Iowa, as I recall. Yeah. And then, of course, in television and with acting in movies and then uh, with TV as well. So he sort of transitioned that era from radio into television. Well, would you say that he did uh, use television the way in which uh, Franklin Roosevelt used the radio? Exactly. But also, Reagan was very careful about being overexposed. Mm -hmm. And that's a great, of great significance in this media 24-hour-a-day cycle we have now. Yes, and we're going to get into that a little bit later as we talk about how we knew it was, deal with the 24-hour news portion now. Uh, going in 1984, uh, President Reagan's uh, running for re-election against former Vice President Mondale and wins once again in a landslide, 49 states as I recall. And uh, Geraldine Farrow, Ferraro is selected as a uh, running mate, first yeah. woman uh, nominated. Uh, was, with, did you cover those conventions as well, 1980 and 84? Yeah, I did. And was it a total surprise when Geraldine Ferraro was selected? Uh, no, I think that uh, it was time for a woman. Mm -hmm. And they probably wished to have somebody from the East Coast. And she was very bright. But it was just no contest. There's a saying in Washington, D.C., and you covered it there for many years, and I worked there, and it's uh, people are policy. During Reagan's first term, you had uh, the triumph in there um, with Jim Baker's chief of staff, Michael Deaver, doing the PR work, and Ed Meese as counselor to the president. Then uh, going into the second term, they leave, and you bring in a new team. And uh, Don Regan came in, and it didn't look like it was a very good mix, and at the same time we had... Uh, a difficult period of time in the Cold War, and Iran-Contra emerged. Uh, you know Reagan's great problem? No. But he underestimated Nancy Reagan. <laughs> and you do that at your own peril. That's right. A very, very potent woman. Very, yes. And um, with, uh, it was like, Senator Laxalt had uh, shared with me how they went through sort of the decision-making process, because as when Don Regan was then being exited out as chief of staff, they wanted, there was a lot of talk about Senator Laxalt going in, and Senator Laxalt came up with another idea, and that was uh, Howard Henry Baker, and uh, share with me the story how he called Senator Baker, and Baker was going to run for president, and, uh, and said, you know, uh, would you be willing in case President Reagan would like to have you as chief of staff? And, Howard Baker talked it through and ended up agreeing not to run president. He ran for president himself and then became chief of staff to President Reagan. And do we have any people like Howard Baker that would give up personal ambitions uh, like that and say, if, if a president needs me, if my country needs me, I'll forget running for president? I don't think so. Uh, he was a, a, of the real McCoy, mm -hmm. came out of Tennessee. And uh, no, I don't think we have those kind of people anymore. Reagan's dealing with the uh, Soviets. Uh, first there was Brezhnev, and then there was Andropov, then there was Chernenko, and then finally Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, I don't think anybody really had any expectations that we would ever see an end to the Cold War, that it would be with us perpetually, and the worst fear was that we would end up in a war. Was anybody ever thinking about the possibility of this Cold War would just disappear and that the Soviet Union would disappear? I don't know, but I know that Ronald Reagan ended it because I think the Russians underestimated him and when they were dealing with the test ban treaty uh, or the nuclear shield at Reykjavik, mm -hmm. the Russians called the meeting uh, to an end took a recess, and apparently, who was that, Gorbachev at the time? Mm -hmm. Yes. Said to his colleagues, gentlemen, there's no sense kidding ourselves, or whatever the word for it is in Russian, the man really means what he says. And they hadn't been prepared. But something else happened. 
they were at the Lake of Annecy and they were walking down to um, the lake. Gorbachev stumbles, Reagan helps him, and I said to my wife, this guy knows how to deal. We're going to take a brief pause here now, and then we'll come back to uh, the interview with Mr. Sander Van Oker. Nice. Oops. Yeah, sure. Let's go. Moms everywhere are finding ways to keep kids active and healthy. Works every time. Get ideas, get involved, get going at letsmove.gov. As we look at that period of time, because uh, you're not only been one of the outstanding journalists of uh, our time, but also an excellent historian, as we saw the evolution from the Great War, World War I, into World War II, and then the Cold War. Uh, there was a lot of views that we would never, ever get out of this period of time. In fact, Henry Kissinger even said in 1975 that he felt we were on the losing side of history. And Henry Kissinger was on the losing side of history. <laughs> Have you shared that with him? <laughs> but Reagan came in the opposite, and he had a simple phrase. He said, uh, we win, we we win, you lose, but he did it in a manner that was not threatening. Uh, his uh, work with the uh, with the Soviet leadership, and as three Soviet leaders died before he, before he ever had a chance to meet, and then by the time Gorbachev came in, Reagan seemed to be convinced, and Senator Laxalt and I have talked about this, is that that was what his presidency was about, was the confidence of this country getting back on track, and we had to find a way out of this Cold War. Because he had confidence in himself. Mm -hmm. Why, why did he, how did he end up developing so much? You talk about President Ford had confidence in himself, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt had confidence in himself, Eisenhower did, and how, is that an absolute key ingredient for a person to be a successful president, is to have confidence well, in himself? Well, in Reagan's self? case, it was sealed by the fact he had a very good agent named Lou Wasserman head of MCA, uh -huh. who saved his career. And I think Reagan always had confidence in himself, but also he respected it in others, too. He knew who he was and was at peace with who he was. And there's so many presidents who are not. I remember after the first summit in Geneva, Sam Donaldson, uh, one of your former colleagues, asked the president as, as he was leaving, he said, Mr. President, uh, did you find Mr. Gorbachev uh, tough to negotiate with? And Reagan smiled and said, Oh, Sam, he says, remember, I used to sit down with Louis Mayer and Sam Goldwyn. How do you view those Hollywood years with Reagan and head of the Screen Actors Guild? Uh, how important were they into his eventual presidency? Terribly important because he went from being very left to the other side, I'm not going to say right, but to the Republican side. And... Uh, a lot of people respected him, including the people you've mentioned, because they didn't think there was any guile to this guy. What you saw was what you got. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Iran-Contra. For the past three months, I've been silent on the revelations about Iran. And you must have been thinking, well, why doesn't he tell us what's happening? Why doesn't he just speak to us as he has in the past when we've faced troubles or tragedies? Others of you, I guess, were thinking, what's he doing hiding out in the White House? Well, the reason I haven't spoken to you before now is this. You deserve the truth, and as frustrating as the waiting has been, I felt it was improper to come to you with sketchy reports or possibly even erroneous statements, which would then have to be corrected, creating even more doubt and confusion. There's been enough of that. I paid a price for my silence in terms of your trust and confidence. That is often referenced as uh, similar to Watergate in some ways. What were your views on that? And uh, there's a lot of views that President Reagan came close to losing his presidency during that period of time. Well, those things happen. It depends on what kind of advisors you get, what kind of national security advisors you get. Anybody with half a brain would know the Europe, the West, has never really come out very well in the Middle East because they are too simplistic and so forth. Well, right now we're finding out how difficult it is. 
Reagan never took anything for granted. And uh, he wasn't uh, kind of underestimating himself, but he also had a confidence that I think came through, whether it's domestic or foreign. Mm -hmm. And I think we miss it. Moving on to 1988 then, uh, Vice President George H.W. Bush uh, then is seeking the presidency and um, his opponent is uh, Michael Dukakis, as I recall. And there had been no sitting vice president since uh, Martin Van Buren, I think in 1846 or thereabouts. I wasn't alive at that time, but I read a few history books on that. Here's the first sitting vice president elected in the 20th century. Um, uh, how do you view that transition uh, with George H.W. Bush going into the presidency after President Reagan and his performance? Good, because he's a good man. Uh, and uh, the company needed somebody. He's a very honest man and uh, no guile to him and has friends on both sides of the aisle. And I think that was a good transitional period. But Dukakis ruined himself by having his picture taken <laughs> in the tank. <laughs> It's interesting how little moments we talk about uh, the debate with President uh, Ford and Governor Carter at the time, the slip on Poland, the appearance on TV of Richard Nixon versus Jack Kennedy, and uh, the photograph of Michael Dukakis, how it is that one little incident can impact the outcome of a presidential election. Yeah. And it almost seems a little unfair because there's so much more than just one little incident, but uh, it seems like it, that can determine the outcome. Who said life is unfair? <laughs> I think we find that out as we go through life, yes. unfortunately. And uh, with the, uh, as George H. W. Bush was president, and the Berlin Wall comes down. <laughs> You covered Europe, you covered the presidency, uh, you were a real student and experienced person in world affairs. Did you ever think you would see that day come? No. I was in Berlin before the wall was built, and then uh, when Kennedy said, ich bin ein Berliner, uh, you had to see that wall and had to live as I did in Berlin for two years to grasp the enormity, the symbolism of that wall. And uh, I didn't know if it ever would come down. I didn't know if the Soviet Union would collapse. Well, uh, George F. Kennan had some hope, maybe, when he proposed the containment theory, maybe. Uh, well, he did, and, 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 uh, and uh, he wrote that long letter, it was called, and it got to Washington at the same time the ambassador, Averill Harriman, was there. And Harriman cabled him, as one historian said, a uh, effusive letter of congratulations. And then the author said, Harriman was always very, very uh, conscious of his power. He thought praise from him was just enough that anyone needed. <laughs> we referenced the Middle East uh, under George H.W. Bush's presidency. Um, there's an invasion into uh, Kuwait by Sa Saddam Hussein. Desert Storm was that uh, that handling of that situation with President Bush and where we're at today. We are where we've always been. In three letters, oil. Look, you have to go back to the Crusades. 
um, to find out how we don't really get a grasp. You know, people thought Lawrence of Arabia had it, and so nobody understands that part of the world, including the people who live there. And now that Europe is falling apart, I think the question before the American people is, what is our role in the world? Is there anywhere written that we have to be policemen of the world with what we've got here? Well, that's a good question you just raised. What is our role in the world as we look ahead to the future? At this present moment, looking ahead for the next several decades, what is our role in the world? Our role in the world is our role here at home. What are we going to do about health care? What are we going to do about our children's education? What are we doing about something called middle class marginality? What are we doing about people living longer but yet having to support their children and maybe their grandchildren? I'm not an isolationist, but I tell you, I think we've got to put priorities where they belong, and I think we have to put it up to the rest of the world. You've got a role in this, too. Hmm. George Bush uh, running for re-election in uh, 1992 and had debates with Governor Clinton from Arkansas. George H.W. Bush looks at his watch at one point. Was that, was that a uh, little slip that uh, perhaps cost him more than he had wishes wished to have done? Probably. Yeah. But he, George H.W. Bush is a man without any guile. And that was an honest mistake, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. He shouldn't have made. <laughs> okay. Going in, uh, because George H.W. Bush, as we clarify there, um, saw, was a pilot in World War II at the end. And, uh, so he, and he was part of the, the World War II generation. President Clinton then becomes president. Baby boom generation. We move into a new era, just as Jack Kennedy did with the World War II generation. Uh, I, William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear. I, William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Looking back, as we talked about the free speech movement in Berkeley and the radical politics, baby boom generation. What do you uh, make of that whole group of people, which I'm a member of, and uh, how poor or good, are we? what have we done? What has a baby boom generation done in this country, good and bad? Sucked on their parents. <laughs> well, that's a very candid comment. <laughs> it's, you know, by that being uh, their, their, what they did to make the world a little better? I just think that they haven't had enough calamity or authority to rub up against. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's easy to put pins in Dr. Spock, but they had an easy life. <clears throat> and above all, I think this question of did they have authority to rub up against is not very encouraging. Mm -hmm. So 1992, the World War II generation is leaving the presidency after the run from President Kennedy all the way through George H.W. Bush. Baby boom generation comes into the presidency with uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, the Cold War coming to an end. Uh, wonderful diplomatic achievement. And there's a technology boom, particularly up north of here in the Sil Silicon Valley. Uh, things are looking pretty good. The baby boom generation comes in the presidency, and uh, things are going pretty well, it looked like, in the 1990s. And how do you view uh, President Clinton when he went in the presidency and how he performed during his eight years that he served there, actually? Well, i got a certain fondness for Arkansas because I covered the Little Rock mm -hmm. uh, occasion for two years, and they've sent some good people to the Congress. I think he did a pretty good job, but I think it's all summed up what happened. In two Secret Service guys outside the house up in Chappaquiddick, was that it? Mm-hmm, yes. 
and one says to the other, what kind of a name is that? And the other guy says, Indian. The first guy said, Indian, what's it stand for? The other guy says, separate bedrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that they uh, did a lot for the morality. And it's been said the presidency is preeminently a place of moral leadership. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think I've ever seen a smarter president, smarter mm -hmm. than Bill Clinton. So I have to give him, and I don't mean to sound condescending, a passing grade. You just reference, maybe, because you reference Arkansas and having a, uh, an affinity for the state, you covered Little Rock then, yeah. uh, 1957. Yeah, for two years. John Chancellor was there the first year. That's uh, That was a tremendous turning point for the yes. civil rights period of time. You covered that. Can you just add something to our audience here about that period of time and covering Little Rock? That was during Dwight Eisenhower's presidency. When it was, that. and President Eisenhower was very forthright and brave. Good evening, my fellow Americans. First, I should like to express my gratitude to the radio and television networks for the opportunities they have given me over the years to bring reports and messages to our nation. To send the troops in, which I don't think he thought was worth the cause that they were representing, but he sent them in nevertheless. And um, my fascination is I never expected this to happen in Arkansas, because it isn't a real southern state. Uh -huh. It is, but it isn't. It's not one of those plantation slavery and things like that, but it happened there. So all it left with me is the idea that you can't anticipate anything with any certainty. Uh -huh. Interesting. And then we're going to uh, move on here uh, in uh, now into the presidency of another baby boom uh, president, and uh, the Middle East comes into play here again because we move into a whole new era. And before we move into that, uh, though, we're going to just take another brief pause here and, uh, and have a public announcement and then come back. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. Uh, welcome back to Interesting People with my special guest, Mr. Sander Van Oker. And uh, we were just about, we were finishing up on discussing the period of time under President uh, Clinton. In his uh, 1996 re-election, it was kind of uh, an age factor there to some extent. Here you had the baby boom generation, and the Republicans ended up stepping back to Senator Robert Dole, world, a very honored uh, World War II veteran. Uh, was age a big factor in that election between Dole and Clinton? I think it was, and uh, Bob Doe is very smart, got a wicked tongue. Yes. <laughs> uh, but I think the country was at peace with itself, and didn't want to make any changes. Mm -hmm. One of the controversies there is the infamous impeachment uh, over the Monica Lewinsky incident. What was that all about, and was that uh, justified in any way, do you well, I don't know what reality was. I thought he was impeachable on grounds of taste. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, I'm not going to ex explore that too much further with you, but... <laughs> Which I wish you told him that. <laughs> and now as we uh, move on to the next stage and um, 2000 election, uh, Vice President Al Gore and uh, Governor George W. Bush from Texas. In, in probably the, the closest election of the 20th century. The Kennedy-Nixon election was very close. But this one's even closer. And it ended up going all the way to the Supreme Court to uh, get a decision to made to bring this to a resolution. The closeness of that election, how, did, how were you viewing that? Was that a rare moment in American history? And, and how much did that impact uh, the ability of George W. Bush then to perform under such a close and controversial election? Well, I think they took the thing in Florida. 
and uh, and uh, I think George W. Bush just behaves as he behaves. He, uh, he I, I don't understand where this overconfidence comes from. He didn't get it from his father. Uh, and uh, I don't think the, cup, the country suffered greatly. On the other hand, we got involved in some overseas adventures that I'm not sure we had any business being there. 9-11, uh, George W. Bush president in uh, eight months. 9-11 happens. Uh, everything seems to change. Uh, what, what has been the impact upon 9-11 on this country and the world? Well, I think the impact has been we're vulnerable. I don't think this country ever thought it was really vulnerable. But this is why I believe that technology is the only sovereignty left in the world. Uh, how did this ever happen? How did they get control of those planes? It's possible, you see, and I don't think we were prepared for it. Elaborate a little bit more when you use that phrase, technology is the only real sovereignty. Can you explain a little bit more what you mean by that? Well, just look when people get out of cars. I go by papers in the morning, usually women with children in the car. First thing they do is get the thing. Then you got the iPads, you got the candles, and my oldest friend is a man named Newton Menno, who was Kennedy's chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, invented the phrase vast wasteland. Mm -hmm. And uh, Newt uh, has always felt that uh, technology rules everything. And he told a story of Thoreau at Walden Pond trying to go to sleep, knock on the door, and the neighbors said, Henry, you must wake up. Why? <laughs> Maine has just been connected with Texas by telegraph. He, Thoreau, is not very impressed. He said, Henry, now Maine can talk to Texas. And Thoreau is supposed to have said, what if Maine has nothing to say to <laughs> Texas? Well, I think the same thing now. We got these iPads, we got these Kindles, and uh, it doesn't require any thought. Uh, and you punch away, and I think we're at the mercy of technology. We use it, but I don't think we understand it. Inter interesting. When you reference oil in the Middle East, I mean, we obviously need oil to move, move vehicles, planes, everything. So it's got that power to it because it helps us move. Technology also helps us move, moves information, ideas. So are we moving more than what we need to know these days through technology? Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. When Mrs. Clinton was screwing up medical care in the Clinton administration, and Pat Moynihan was still chairman of the Finance Committee, one night at dinner he explained with some exasperation to us what she doesn't understand is that technology is spewing out medicines and equipment faster than our capacity, not just to pay for them, in many instances, to know how to use them properly. Mm -hmm. Like today, there's hardly a day or a week goes by where they haven't tested rats or something else and found out something that we thought was good is not good. We're overloaded with information. Hmm. And the real test is, what decision do we make? Do we just do what we're told by technology? Uh, or do we think things through ourselves? I don't have an answer. So, but you're, it seems like you're identifying that one of the problems is the ability to do some form in the way of logical, critical thinking among people to d digest this information and yeah, use it yeah, yeah, yeah. responsibly. Yeah, yeah. So that's maybe where we're really lacking in this country is. Yeah. And uh, see, I'll give you an example. 
We now have what's called gridlock in the Congress. Mm -hmm. The Founding Fathers had another name, checks and balances. Democracy is not supposed to be smooth. As I think Mark Twain said, it's the worst form of government except for all the others that have been tried. But we think, because of this technology, that's sacred. Mm -hmm. It's not sacred because of what we put into it. And we want to get what we want out of it, but sometimes we don't. Uh, a colleague of mine who's an historian uh, shared with me just a few days ago that you um, had spoken at the Fletcher School of Diplomacy uh, some years ago when he was a student there. Closed down immediately afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, his recollection is that you uh, referenced at that time, and I don't know how many years ago, I'm guessing 20 years ago, 25, I'm not sure, about terrorism and uh, that you had brought it up in your talk at that time. Was there, uh, I mean, since 9-11, terrorism is on our minds, a key part of our foreign policy, our domestic policy. Were you aware early on about the potentiality of this element of terrorism and what it could become? Well, I've always been very careful about technology because I think you have to be able to control it. But I think at the same time, technology has almost a power to do whatever it wishes to without our controlling of it. I'm not against it, uh, but we have to be very careful of how it's used. What, what is terrorism about? What, why, uh, why is this a centerpiece of our domestic and foreign policy now compared to well, during the Cold War era and other periods of time? Because we have a world, a large part of which envies us and hates us and has the money and the technology to do damage to us. Why do they not like us? Envy. That's a pretty, pretty simple and clear, clear answer. The um, decision making that went through that led us into Iraq number one then Afghanistan, your views on that decision making process under President George W. Bush? You have to go back the time when we deposed the first elected premier in Iran. It was a CIA plot run by a man named Kermit Roosevelt. We don't know what we're doing in the Middle East. People have been going in there since the Crusades. And uh, I think we think it's a pushover and it's not. Like, I'd like to know if something still exists which was signed by the Soviet Union and Iran, a non-aggression pact, back in the early 1920s. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows about this. And uh, we thought Turkey was on our side. It ain't. Uh, so I think it's folly to think just we have a little knowledge, but not much wisdom, that we can stop these things. Be on guard for them, yeah. But don't think you're omnipotent. Is the, uh, with the internet now and uh, with the advent of uh, television, Hollywood, I remember reading some years ago that 85% of the movies seen around the world were American movies. And uh, the impact of the spread of information is, is, is part of what the reaction of, of terrorism or its birth is a fear of the, uh, the continued spread of uh, Western influence, uh, democratic influence, of the expansion of the role of women. Yes, yes. And fear of what that can do to their own uh, more cautious or conservative societies, shall I say? Or backward societies. Hmm. You brought up before how they treat women. Who's responsible? They're responsible. They suffered Gaddafi all those years in Libya. Who's responsible? They are responsible. Sure, a little bit, uh, talking about the role of women. Uh, there's been views that uh, Japan, you know, they've had 20 years, they call it the lost 20 years or whatever. The Japanese economy was on the rise for so long, and uh, yet they've been very slow uh, integrating women into the mainstream, shall I say. Has that been, is that, a, is that part of the failure of 
contemporary societies not to uh, have more balance with the role of men and women economically, politically, and... I don't know the answer. All I know is whatever a woman tells me, I'll believe it. <laughs> <laughs> the smarter I, we are. <laughs> I've always known you've been a wise man, Sander. No. <laughs> <laughs> we go into uh, now our the current presidency. Um, Senator Clinton and uh, Senator Obama were running against each other for the nomination. Republicans were, in 2008, Republicans were having a hard time figuring on somebody. They finally settled on John McCain, pre-baby boom also, as Robert Dole was. Uh, a lot of people never saw the, the um, eventuality of Barack Obama defeating Senator Clinton, number one, and going on to the presidency. Tell us about your views of that election and, uh, the, and uh, the election of Barack Obama. Well, I don't think Mrs. Clinton is the warmest person in the world. Uh, and I think Obama ran a good campaign. I'm not sure he's run a good presidency. She hasn't been bad as Secretary of State. But look, in, J in January I'll be 84 years old. I've earned the right to say, I don't have an answer. I don't know. I don't know at this stage of the game whether Mitt Romney is going to be the Republican nominee. But I know the Republicans have got more disunity in their party than the Democrats. Now, will they know how to deal with the Tea Party? Will Herman Cain know how to deal with these allegations, true or false? I don't know. President Obama, when he came in, was uh, anxious in, uh, to get his war in Iraq over with, to close Guantanamo, and actually doubled down on Afghanistan. So we go back to the Middle East uh, with Iraq and uh, our role in the Middle East, even though we're phasing out our role now, it seems to still be that we're, we're always obligated to be involved in the Middle East in some way or manner, it seems like. Or India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, you know why? I don't think any of these people have ever read Rudyard Kipling. They find out how complicated it is. Yeah, I think you're probably very correct. We're going to now take a brief pause and uh, and then come back for the final 15 minutes of this uh, discussion interview with Sander Van Oker. Thank you. Packers. Viking. Packers. Viking. Packers. Viking. Packers. Red state. Blue state. Vegan. Carnivore. We come from different places. Uptown. Downtown. Optimus. Center. We come to different conclusions. Half empty. Half full. But when we live united, we create real, lasting change in the building blocks of life. The education, income, and health of our communities, <laughs> our families, united. even the person next to us. Live united. Real change won't happen without you. So give, advocate, volunteer. Live united. Sign up at liveunited.org. Welcome back to Interesting People and with our special guest today, Mr. Sander Van Oker. We're just uh, concluding uh, talking about the uh, presidency of uh, Barack Obama. Looking uh, ahead here now, we've got re-election coming up. What are the probabilities or possibilities of his re-election, given the uncertainties in the Republican Party that you're referencing? Well, he hasn't got anything to worry about as a challenger with his own party that I know of. And I think that the Republicans are going to be rather prone to rich, rip each other apart. Uh, here we have Obama and facing who on the other side? It appears to be Romney. My son works in Salt Lake City. He's covering Romney. Um, Will, and he and I have discussed Will Mormonism be the same problem to Romney that Catholicism was to Kennedy? We don't know. All we got is questions. And we have to also find out what's the media going to do? We know all these things have been shoved up to the beginning of the year. I remember there was a time when New Hampshire came up in March and followed in April by mm -hmm. Wisconsin. We've never had this logjam we have, and we've never had this 24-hour news cycle and all these people telling us what they think we should know. 
you anticipated my question. And because uh, as we go into uh, in these final 10, 15 minutes of our discussion here about the media, about the flow of information, historically as well as the present and the future and where we're going or may or may not be going, I did some quick calculations we had referenced earlier that at the inception of your career we had a 15-minute evening news, then dramatically they went to 30 minutes, which was considered a lot of time. So from 15 minutes to 30 minutes in the last 50 years or so, we're now to 1,440 minutes every single day with 24-hour news. It's, is this now changed the way in which we view uh, politics, economics, we view our culture, we view ourselves, and how do we, what does this all mean now with, it's always there with us now, 24 yeah, hours a day. You see, I came out of an era, as my father did, with the chief question in politics, what have you done for me lately? And uh, with this middle class marginality we have, I don't think people in either party think their government has done much for them. And depending upon which way the Supreme Court goes on medical care, who knows what our medical care is going to be like? Who knows what the retirement age? All we have now are just a lot of questions and not many certain answers. Maybe it's because there are no certain answers and we've just woken up to the fact there aren't. And we got all this um, we call it the electronic tapeworm, uh, spewing out all this information that's been fed without any analysis. Mm -hmm. Well, we talked earlier about the transition from radio to television, and uh, now we're in a period of time where all these new forms of uh, communication and news and everything, particularly with the Internet, has changed again. So it's a whole new universe out there, a whole new world. And you talk about how do, what, what potential way is there? What's any thoughts about how we deal with this incredible uh, flood of of everything? Drink a lot. Drink a lot. <laughs> Pull the plug a lot too, and uh... no, learn how to say, "I don't know," mm -hmm. or "I'll get back to you." But it's almost as if all these things demand, or we think they demand, an instantaneous, certain reply. And there is no such thing. Mm -hmm. When we were talking earlier too, Sander, uh, this period of time, people were uh, unsure about things. Of course, I think we're always unsure of things. We, nothing's ever for certain. But uh, as we were talking earlier um, off camera, you have confidence in this country, and I have confidence in this country. Despite all this, why, why do you have confidence in this country and the future of this country? Because it's not my line, some poet, nothing like us ever was. Uh, I think we are a beacon to the world. We have plenty of faults. But you go back 50 years, what were the main preoccupations? The Cold War and race. I'm not saying we're perfect on race, but thanks to people like Dr. King and people whites like Walter Ruther of the UAW, we made tremendous strides. And there's a lot in this country that I think should be a beacon to the world. All I worry about is trying to do too much at once without having thought it through. And I want, above all, the civility that I grew up with covering politics to return. And I don't see it coming back. How do you bring civility back? Drink bar? <laughs> I don't know. We were also talking, we're here in California and uh, visiting with you in Santa Barbara and uh, this program is going to be broadcast uh, in the Bay Area and elsewhere too. Uh, California having a difficult time as so many states are around the country and uh, trying to make the government work, the local governments work, figure out public responsibilities, private responsibilities. California, where, 
where are we going? What tell? You, you can remember back when we had a, we were very made a lot of progress during the years when Pat Brown, Governor Reagan, other people. Uh, what's happening here in California? One, I don't know, but I'm guided by the great comedian Fred Allen's line about California. California is a nice place to live if you're an orange. <laughs> I think this state is like no other place in the world. I love it. It's bountiful, but we've got problems, and I think we're doing a pretty good job. But I'll give you an example. I think the higher education system in this country, both the universities and the city colleges, are really the emblem of this state. And I was told by someone who worked for Pat Brown, that both Pat Brown and Ronald Reagan wanted to keep them high quality because they fed, trained people into the defense industry, which is vital to this state's economic well-being. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got a lot of information, and I'm not sure about how much judgment we have. Well, it seems to be a common theme that we've that uh, we've discussed here is the need to for judgment, uh, better judgment, uh, not only among leaders in politics but uh, business leaders, community levels, all of us. You had uh, one of the first business shows ever on yes. television. Tell us a little bit about that and business judgment, because uh, a lot of controversy these days about Wall Street and. Other, other items along those lines? Well, I was very happy to be able to do business. I think it's at the heart of us being able to do certain things that are denied to other people, maybe by themselves. But um, I think that businesses better look at themselves very carefully because this Occupy Wall Street is not just a war protest like the one we went through. This is very, very important. That people feel screwed by their financial institutions and they don't like it because they work very hard for their money and they're getting less money for their money than they used to. And if somebody comes out with a latter-day Huey Long from the early days of the 1930s, uh, can do a lot of damage, so we've got to be very careful. When you talk about the educational system here in California, the universities, the colleges are considered uh, some of the best in the world, and uh, a lot of difficulties now. Cost of education has risen dramatically. That's part of what these protests are about. And, uh, and uh, our public school system, particularly at the elementary and secondary levels, we seem to have uh, real difficulties there bringing out uh, students with their more able to use better judgment and for their own lives what they do. Um, how, do how do we deal with the educational system and how do we make things a little bit better to move in the right direction? One, you have a uniform dress code in all our public schools. Two, children must learn Latin. Well. Three, children must learn math. And what we have to find out is the technology that the kids are being brought up with harmful or helpful to development of cognitive functions. Do you have a thought process that you put away and you come back to it 30 years? Or do you have a process now where you go to the computer? We know the answer to the question. So I think we've got to go back to basics. Those are, that's a fascinating response, Senator. Tell me about dress code. Why do you feel that's important? Well, there have been some experiments in this country. One was here in California, and the grades were not very good, so they informed a dress code, and the grades improved. There are a lot of black parents who have sent their kids to parochial schools. Why? They learn Latin. They know they get their knuckles busted by Sister Immaculata. <laughs> but they know discipline, mm -hmm. and that's what we've got to have in this country, in our schools. 
So discipline and judgment. And um, it's interesting we say math and Latin, too. That's not something that people, uh, I mean, we they talk a lot about the importance of math and science. and uh, But Latin, that's not something that uh, people reference these days. I know they don't Latin, uh, reference it these days, but I think, though I can't, say I'm an expert on grammar, but I think because I took Latin tucked away in my brain, are guidelines as to what is correct and what isn't. Where do you think these phrases like you know and I mean come from? Latin. Well, <laughs> they come from people not being sure yeah. that they are being understood. Well, I still remember a Latin phrase, cum uh, grano salus, with a grain of salt, and how important it is to understand uh, what we know and what we don't know, and to take things uh, sometimes with levity, because there's only so much that we do know. We've got about uh, two and a half minutes to go in this uh, wonderful visit with you, Sander. Tell us a little bit about uh, the future. Now, you're turning 84. You've had a wonderful career and an important career in this country, uh, to, in uh, the news business, and Tell us what uh, you're up to now and the future for yourself. I'm trying to start a program for older people called Screw the Golden Years. <laughs> I also want to write a memoir about what fun journalism was for me. Not journalism as it is today, but what fun I had in it. As Marty Nolan of the Boston Globe said, it was inside work and there was no heavy lifting. <laughs> in all your your years, what are, so what's the f one or two most important stories that you feel you covered that uh, meant the most you felt to yourself? Well, civil rights. Civil rights, somewhere. And then the death of the two Kennedy brothers. I think we lost something, and we'll never have it back again. Looking to uh, people, there's a diverse audience that will see this uh, interview, but looking at the uh, younger people, college, high school, what advice would you give to people at this stage and say, what can you do for yourselves to make things better for your, your own lives and our communities and our country and the world? Listen to your parents. Listen to your parents. Is, do people still do, still do that? They don't even know who their parents are. Well, that's part of the problem, perhaps. <laughs> Well, Sander, uh, this is, uh, we're coming to a conclusion here of the second of two one-hour visits with you. And, um, you know, we've been friends for, I think, about 15 years now, and I value your friendship very highly. And I value this privilege to have you on this program, Interesting People, because I'm sure everybody watching this is going to know how interesting a person you are and the great life you've had. And I dare say, going back again, thank you for your service to this country. And I'd like to say thank you and to all of our audience which is still awake. <laughs> Thank you very much, and welcome to Interesting People.